All right, I guess I'm going to get started. Um, hi, I'm Chris. I'm a software engineer at Google. I mostly work on Linux boot these days. Um, you've probably already heard a lot about what it is today, so I'm going to kind of gloss over those parts uh, and go straight kind of to the runtime. Uh, the one thing I'm going to show you is the picture I also showed you this morning, um, which is we actually place Linux in Flash alongside EFI uh, with a specialized runtime for us. Um, that runtime is Go-based uh, and contains a bunch of kexec-based bootloaders that can kexec an actual kernel and operating, or I'm going to say kexec an actual operating system from disk or over the network. Um, if you are curious about this part, we have had lots of other talks, I think, recorded as well. Um, so I'm going to try not to bore you. Uh, and the, the other recap I want to talk about is uh, this allows us to um, use Linux engineers as firmware engineers. Um, and that's actually the part I want to talk about for real. Um, just to kind of um, show you how easy we've made this to build compared to some other firmware solutions. Um, to try this out in QEMU, you actually literally just git clone uh, Linux boot, uh, you plug in a kernel and an initRAMFS, and you say make, right? And about two minutes later, or probably even sooner, you'll actually get a working firmware volume that you can use uh, in QEMU. Um, similar to this, if you are, if you have one of these boards we actually support in the open source version, um, you'd have to read out an existing firmware image from the board. Um, but after that, go just through the same process of make, specify a kernel in itramfs, and make. Uh, and then you flash it back on the board. Um, this should work for the boards that I actually listed here. Uh, in the UEFI repo, and of course, you can also combine Linux boot with core boot, which I believe some of the Facebook people talked about a little bit today, too. Um, so this part should be relatively simple if you're using some of our supported hardware or just QMU to try it out. Um, so what I want to actually talk about is what do we put in the initramfs? Um, and as the Linux boot project, we're kind of of the opinion that you should put whatever you want in there. It's totally up to you, right? If you want to put BusyBox and kexec and some bash scripts to tie it all together in there, go for it. Why not? Um, we probably think that's not a terribly good idea, but um, that's just our informed opinion. Um, so. You could put Pettit Boot in there, for example. This is something that has worked for the open power people for the last four or five years at this point. So that's something pretty tried and tested, for example. Um, but what we're actually putting in there is something called Uroot. Um, Uroot is our Go-based initramfs that has a bunch of uh, BusyBox-like tools like simple re-implementations of LS, DD, CPIO, all this random stuff that a normal busy box would have as well. And then more importantly, some kexec based bootloaders. For example, something Pixie compatible that goes and downloads a kernel over TFTP um, if you're looking to be compatible with the old world of things. Um, or some grub compatible tools that will read grub configurations and figure out which kernel to boot. Um, but all this comes from the realization that we have the full tool set of a Linux application that we can actually use in firmware now. So we want to actually use that, and we would like to make use of a somewhat memory safe language that makes concurrency easy. Um, so we ended up with Go. Maybe today we'd make a different decision. I don't know. Um, but this is what we came up, came up with uh, a little while ago. Um, and another reason for us to use Go is it's very easily cross-compilable. Um, I'm going to show you a little demo of how to use Uroot later. 
um, just because I want you to take away how much easier this stuff is to use than some other tool chains. Um, and Go is also pretty easily reproducible. We've built kind of a build system around our Go stuff, uh, which meant that we had to do some little more complicated things to make it reproducible. But if you were to just compile a Go binary on its own, it should be re reproducible if it's in the same environment. Um, and this is something you get for free with Go uh, versus having to patch your compiler to toolchain to actually uh, get this property, right? Um, and then all the other nice things that come with it are static analysis tools, easy to use unit tests and continuous integration that people have. Um, these are things I think you can easily get with other languages too. Um, but anyway, uh, this is why we're here. But um, if you've listened to some of these talks, you know that we have about what, three to eight megs of space to actually make a kernel and our runtime fit in Flash. And if you've ever used Go, you probably know that a simple Hello World program is about 10 megs. So how do we actually make that fit? Well, for one, the 10 megs luckily compress to about 2 to 3 megs for the simple Hello World. Um, and with that, we've come up with a scheme to take multiple different Go commands and actually just compile them to one binary. Um, Go is a language that statically links everything. So if we were to separately compile each firmware program, you'd get a copy of the Go runtime with each of them, um, which is most of the cost of compiling these, these busy box-like tools. The tools themselves are pretty small and self-contained. Um, but the runtime, if it's not shared, would take up most of the space in your firmware. So by actually compiling everything as one binary together, um, you get to use about, uh, depending on which things you actually put in there, three to five, six megs of space with uh, all uroot commands that we have. Um, but one of the nice things about this scheme is you can also write your own commands outside of the uroot repo and compile them into the busy box. I'm going to show you that in a little bit. Um, and if this is kind of strange to you, this is kind of how you would use uroot to do this. Uh, I'm instead going to switch to my demo. Actually, uh, we're going to go take a quick look at David gave me the suggestion earlier. Right, cat is the simplest of all programs you could imagine. Um, this is a couple lines of code, and I can compile this as a separate executable. It comes out to be 2.1 megs. Oh, I should have put something in there, but yes. Um, if I now go look at CP, actually I'm going to, this is the full path, because in Go you have to be inside a Go path and check out github.com, uroot, uroot, and then go to what's inside that repository. Um, so if I look at CP, and this is, by the way, how easy it is to build Go programs. Go build, and if I want to cross-compile for ARM, this is an x86 machine, by the way, this is as easy as it gets, right? Um, I actually want to go back to the x86 version. Um, right, so these are things that I can uh, compile on their own. However, if I go take a look at tools make BB, there's another program here. that will let me combine these two together. And what I actually get out of this is a BusyBox style binary um, Oh, oops, sorry. If I knew how to use a shell. Right. Um, where for example, argv1 can be used 
to, F, to, to select which code is actually supposed to be run. Um, so if I do this, all right. The other thing I can do is I can create a symlink, which this is one of those things that no one ever remembers which way around this is supposed to be, right? Yes, but I got it right. <laughs> All right, so this is just a busy box binary on its own. Um, this should work with any pure Go source code that you have. Um, we prefer not to have C Go dependencies because it complicates the build system and complicates, uh, well, and complicates the amount of code that actually ends up in firmware. Um, so right now, we restrict this to pure Go programs, which is pretty easy to do given the Go standard library. Um, so this was just a busy box binary on its own, uh, but if you want to use this actually in firmware, you're going to need an, an actual init or MFS. And to build one of those, um, you can go to the top level uroot directory and actually use our build system. So if I say dot slash uroot with a build bb, core is a template for a couple of different commands. Um, the, I'm going to say the normal useful stuff. So what I get is an init ramfs. Um, which has all of the symlinks that you want, as well as the BB binary, as well as um, something like etsy-resolve.conf uh, and an init. Now, if I am to take that <laughs> and run it in QEMU, I will similarly get I should get rid of my phone, huh? Um, I'll similarly get uh, the same busy box environment that we were compiling um, in bbin. Is that correct? Yes. Um, so anytime I actually run a command here, it goes through the busy box binary. Um, that's another good example. So this is actually not the original way that uroot was meant to be used. Um, one of the original modes of uroot was to package the Go compiler and all source to your programs together. Um, for things to be compiled on the fly when you actually use them in your firmware image. So if I change the build mode to source mode here, this is going to take about a minute. It's going to collect all of the dependencies of every package and every command that you're trying to compile into this init ramfs and it's going to include the source. Um, then when you actually run this in QMU or on your actual hardware, um, the init process will compile the actual init process, run that, and then from there, from the shell, every command later will be compiled on the fly. This is a nice tool for debugging because you can remove the executable uh, that was compiled, you can change the source, and you can run the command again to see it be compiled again and actually used. Um, it's an interesting Go debugging tool. Okay, so this was actually built, but what I failed to do was include a text editor. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, Uroot does happen to have a text editor but it's ed, and I don't know how to use ed. Um, so you can bring in outside files with the dash files command, and it will figure out whether it's a binary or not, and also pull in all its LDD dependencies. So if I look at the generated init ramfs here, what I'm going to get is going to take about 20 seconds. Come on. What I'm going to get is bin nano and uh, probably libc.so, and probably whatever other dependencies Nano has. Um, so we have a bunch of symlinks. We have a whole bunch of Go source, because that's needed. 
Um, ah, and we have libraries. These are all the things nano depends on in the elf headers, um, and those get automatically pulled into the netramfs as well. So if I am to run this, this is uh, init being compiled. And keep in mind, uh, this is in a VM. The Go compiler is pretty fast. Uh, it usually takes about half a second to compile anything. Um, the second wait we had there was waiting for the shell to be compiled. And now, for example, if I were to ls-l, we're waiting for ls to be compiled. Of course, after each time you do this, it'll be cached for every subsequent inv invocation. So if I do ls-l again, it's just ls from a binary. Um, but something I can do now is I can go to source github uroot uroot commands ls, ls.go. Ah, I forgot the term cap file. These are things that, there we go. <laughs> I tried vim first. That wasn't a good idea. <laughs> um, if I'm going to go back to this for a second, right? You've seen you can compile any Go program into a busy box, and most likely it's also going to fit into firmware this way. Um, and this is nice for us because now we can write some bootloaders in Go, and we can actually end up giving you all the tools for you to write your own bootloader loader with your own policies and your own custom uh, things you might want to happen. Um, so have you ever used Pixie? I'm sure you have. Um, if you know how it works, uh, excuse the shitty diagram. I drew that just the other day in the morning. <laughs> um, uh, if you've ever used Pixie, you know that um, you're sending a DHCP request that gets a file name as a response. You use that file name to download something called a Pixie Linux from a TFTP server, which is yet another kernel uh, that will be executed, well, kernel, but runs in ring zero, I think, um, that will be executed to download configuration files that determine which kernel will actually be downloaded. Um, you probably also know that there is usually no implementation of any kind of kernel verification or use of the TPM or anything here, um, which is usually accomplished through shims or other random weird means um, that people try to insert into this process. But we now have Linux and firmware. We have control over our bootloaders. You can, in Go, uh, which has a native HTTP client library and a native implementation of other random crypto things, easily download a kernel um, over HTTP. And the alternative would be to go and, I guess, re-implement HTTP, TLS, SSL, IPv6, DHCPv6, all these things either in UAFI or in IPixie or other environments where you don't have syscalls, for example. Right? And with that comes the problem of the drivers and all that stuff. But the point here is you have all these things at your fingertips in Linux. It's pretty easy to use. Um, but even if you, if you answer all these questions like, am I going to not use TFTP and use HTTP instead, and you get rid of option ROMs altogether, um, if you do download a kernel and you try to verify its signature with something, right? whose keys do you trust? What do you actually verify? And what happens when it doesn't verify? Right? Do you still k-exec the kernel, but you leave the disk encrypted, or you tell the TPM to seal? I don't know what TPMs actually can do, so I'm just going to stop there. Um, you could, I don't know, tell the TPM to throw away its private keys that let you access the production network in some way. Right? These are all custom things that you need to think about for your platform, because it's your platform security features that are different from ours in some time in some ways. Um, or, for example, the kernel fails to verify, and what you actually do is you go out to the network, talk to some service, and say, hey, I'm sad. Something happened here. 
you need to come fix the server. Right? Um, these are things you might want to do. These are not things we want to prescribe to you. So we're building our own bootloaders in Go, but the packages will be reusable by you to write your own stuff. Or of course, you can use some of the distributions we've put together. Um, I guess this just kind of reiterates the point of it's trivial to use modern features from here, right? I honestly also don't care if you use Go or some other language, but these are things that you have available to you now, and these are tools that we're building in Go, so you might as well reuse them. Um, if you are a smaller shop than something like Google or Facebook, maybe this would actually be appropriate for you, right? You've generated a key pair that you sign all your kernels with. You just W get it from the network somewhere. And you burn the, this sequence of things into your firmware on all your machines. Right? This is the simplest version of what you could do. But it's already, in some ways, more powerful than old style Pixie Boot. Um, it's just that you might have to spend some time uh, thinking about this. Um, so if I go back to this demo, and we wait for init to be compiled again, <laughs> as well as Elvish. And you make sure LS is actually compiled first. Now we can actually do something. <laughs> so first, I want to actually prove to you that things are cached. Right now, if I just rerun ls, nothing's going to happen. My new code doesn't actually execute. Um, but if I remove the cached version of ls, which we have to wait for RM to compile. <laughs> um, we can go back and rebuild it from source and get hello world. Um, this is kind of an interesting tool when you're trying to figure out um, programs that don't actually that you don't actually want to run on your actual machine. Um, for example, if I'm debugging a kexec based bootloader, I would rather it be in a VM where I can keep rewriting its source rather than um, basically hosing my own machine every time I try to kexec, right? Um, so this makes for an interesting debugging tool. Um, this actually was initially intended f to have completely architecture independent Go source as an init MFS, because you can package the Go compiler and all the pieces that can cross-compile easily for pretty much any platform. So if I package a Go compiler for ARM64 and x86 in here, I can drop the exact same binary init MFS in my ARM64 machine and my x86 machine. You end up with the actual exact same code. Um, this is kind of nice. Uh, for platforms where you, for example, want to just boot one image uh, off of everything, the same environment everywhere. Um, but this is not something we actually use today. All right, so like I said before, our security model is not going to be the same as yours. Um, so we're here to give you some tools to deal with that. Um, the, the questions you might need to ask for yourself. Um, some of these are on this slide, but I'm not the authority on all the things you should be thinking about. Right? These are specific to your hardware and specific to what security mechanisms you have built in. So if you have something like Cerberus in your server, right, you might not want to be looking at the TPM, you might want to actually have a chain of signature verification once you have firmware verified by Cerberus. But if you are using a TPM, 
why doesn't your bootloader just measure what it's about to boot into the TPM? Um, these are all things that are going to be specific to you. Um, so my hope is that once we actually have all these tools together, you'll be able to reuse the packages and write your own little bootloader in maybe less than 500 lines of Go code that composes different features we've come up with, like TPM verification or signature verification or any of these kinds of things like that. Um, we already have a couple of implemented actual bootloaders. Um, the projects are a little bit in disarray because we've all gone off and done our own thing for our own infrastructure, but we need to come converge back together in some way. Um, so System Boot, for example, is the Facebook version of this, uh, which has DHCP v6 booting and uh, Slack-based booting, as well as some kind of disk booting based on small grub snippets. Um, they have TPM supports because they actually use TPMs. Um, Whereas some of our code, we have a, an old style Pixie implementation that doesn't verify anything, um, which I think will be useful for people trying to migrate to systems like this. You don't want to change too much. You don't want to change your firmware and all the server side at the same side. Um, but also that's a, a decision that should be left up to you, right? Um, so we've built a whole bunch of tools like this and we would like some of your help uh, to continue doing this. Um, if you want to actually combine Linux boot, uroot, and QEMU, oh, wow, I didn't finish that. Um, I didn't actually insert the URL. Um, we published a guide um, about what kernel configuration to use with Go and Uroot that fits into Flash. Um, I'm going to amend that to the slides later when I actually upload them. Um, but with that, it should be no more than, I'm going to say, 10 minutes of work to actually make a whole system like this work in QEMU together. Um, the Linux boot build system will actually go and build OVMF UEFI firmware for you. There's also a core boot version of that that isn't quite integrated to this build system right now. So that's more work than 10 minutes, but this should be not more time than that. Um, we've already talked about some of these things. You've heard today from Facebook, Google, and IT Renew. Um, and then we have some unnamed users that are currently not quite comfortable uh, talking about Linux boot publicly. Um, but kind of to come back to the point of um, what the project is about is we still want to give you all the tools you need to come up with your own production infrastructure. Um, we're not here to dictate your policy of what should happen when things fail or what should happen in the, uh, in the case that things go right, actually. Um, and with that, it's kind of orthogonal to Linux boot, but um, to actually be able to flash your own firmware on some machines, you need some kind of security and user freedom. Um, there's probably a lot of systems you run that have boot guard these days enabled where only your vendor can actually supply firmware. Um, as opposed to if you have something like Cerberus or Titan in your server where you can have a change of ownership uh, of the system to someone else, and you insert your own keys that verify firmware. Um, so we would like to kind of push in the direction of security and user freedom with this project as well. Um, and then as a third point, um, we see a lot of machines that when you try to boot them but some kind of verification fails, you end up with a brick, uh, something that doesn't boot or doesn't do anything. Um, which is, uh, I think, in some cases, the secure boot model. I'm not sure. Um, but we would like to have tools for systems that still boot and that you can use to maybe reach out to your infrastructure and say, hey, something is wrong here, um, rather than just servers that end up as bricks and that um, 
that you have to somehow detect are in a wrong state. Um, on consumer machines like Chromebooks, this might easily be achieved with, well, you get a scary screen that says, your computer isn't safe, something's wrong. But we're going to let you go anyway, so you might go to your work, but maybe don't log into a bank, right? Um, on the other hand, in a data center environment, you might want to do what I already described with uh, your production infrastructure. Um, and honestly, that, that's something that should be up to you as well, too. And that's going to be specific to your data center. So you need, you need to have these tools to actually build this stuff yourself, right? Um, and then I would like to encourage you to actually join these calls if you are interested in these projects. Um, they're every two weeks. We talk about Linux Boot and the OpenEDK2 and the Mint platform efforts. Um, so you have uh, folks from some vendors like Intel and Microsoft on these calls um, where hopefully some voices are being heard. Um, so I think that's a, a really useful tool to join as well. Um, these are some of the things we might want your help with. Um, but with that, I'm just going to leave you with a bunch of links. Um, you could, the easiest way to actually talk to Linux boot developers is via the Slack channel. So if you're trying this out on your own servers and you run into some problems, you should definitely come join and talk to us. Um, our documentation is not great at the moment, so this is the best way to actually get things done at the moment. Um, any questions? Yeah, um, hold on. There's a microphone. Thanks. Um, you mentioned the list of existing hardware which works with Linux boot. Um, I think, among others, the Dell R630 was um, mentioned. Um, yeah. Is this uh, based on UEFI or based on Core Boot? It's ba all the ones listed there are based on UEFI. Um, they're the ones that you can actually access through that Linux boot repo that I put up there. Mm. Um, and it's based on a, a snapshot readout of Dell R630 firmware. Um, as a follow-up question, the, you mentioned in one of your first slides the boot time changes. Um, would you mind uh, showing them again? Because there is something which looked a bit weird. It does look a bit weird. So that's a, an example from the OCP Winterfell server, which is a Facebook server from five, six, seven years ago, something like that, um, where the original boot time with UEFI firmware was about eight minutes. Um, an interesting side effect of removing about three quarters of the Dixie drivers on that platform is that boot time actually reduces from eight minutes to 20 seconds. Um, that's not necessarily a side effect of inserting Linux. It's a side effect of removing a whole bunch of other things. Um, so this is not a typo, but actual real. No, that's real. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>